Welcome to Dominican University of California, and it is our pleasure to welcome you to the Leadership Lecture Series with Valerie Jarrett in conversation with Elaine Petricelli. My name is Denise Lucy, and I'm the Executive Director of the Institute for Leadership Studies and a Professor of Business and Organizational Studies, and so proud to represent Dominican tonight. So the Institute for Leadership Studies is a leadership development center, and we offer the lecture series in partnership with Book Passage. Book Passage is our community center, isn't it? Yes, it is. And yes, let's please thank them for bringing to Marin County these remarkable leaders, because leadership is not only in business, it's in all the disciplines. And so our lecture series seeks to bring leaders from across this country to our campus to engage with you and our students. And tonight we have many students in the hall. I notice they're in the back, though. <laughs> Hello, students. I wonder if we could have a round of applause by students. How are you doing back there? <laughs> Good, very nice. So we seek to inspire and highlight acts of leadership across the disciplines. This is our 15th season, and we've had, this marks our 128th lecture in part partnership with Book Passage. And what amazing change leaders we've brought to Marin. So thank you for Book Passage for doing it, and for Elaine and Bill for their vision and their commitment to our community. A program like this, of course, takes sponsors, and we have several sponsors for our program, led by our lead sponsor, Fairview Capital, which is a boutique wealth management and investment advisory firm headquartered here in Greenbrae. Founded in 1995 by Andy Matheson, Fairview Capital currently manages more than $2 billion for individuals, trusts, retirement plans, and foundations and endowments. The firm provides a high level of ethical and personalized service that encompasses both investment management and financial planning. The Fairview team is committed to delivering results that helps its clients prosper and achieve their financial and life goals. They are proud to serve the nonprofits of Marin County through their extensive volunteer engagement program and their team and community involvement. Their support of our program as our lead sponsor is truly a community engagement opportunity. Please thank Fairview Capital. <clears throat> our diamond sponsor for our lecture series this year is Elam Pinal Compass. Founded in 1990, Elam Pinal Compass Realtors is the leader in luxury real estate in the San Francisco Bay Area. Thank you very much, Elam Pinal Compass. Our bronze sponsors for this evening are Marin County Free Library and the Marin County Library Foundation, which seeks to ensure that our county library creates and maintains a dynamic modern library system with excellent facilities that serve Marin County residents. The library has partnered with us many times and we are thrilled, thrilled that you are here tonight. Thank you so much, Marin County Free Library. Another of our frequent sponsors is Redwood Credit Union. Yay, Redwood Credit Union. Who's out there, Redwood Credit Union? I'm a member too. It seeks to help people achieve their goals and their dreams, passionately serving the best interests of their members, employees, and communities, and you do, and we thank you so very much. Thank you, Redwood Credit Union. Redwood Credit Union. All right. On, so it is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Andy Matheson founder of Fairview Capital, who will welcome our guests, Valerie Jarrett and Elaine Petricelli. Welcome, Andy Matheson. I'm very privileged to welcome our guests this evening, former senior advisor to President Barack Obama, business leader and author, Valerie Jarrett. Valerie was born in Iran and grew up in Chicago in the 1960s as racial and gender barriers were being challenged. 
She later attended Stanford University and the University of Michigan Law School. Valerie got her start in politics in 1987 with Chicago Mayor Harold Washington's historic administration. In 1991, Valerie Jarrett hired a promising young lawyer named Michelle Robinson for a job in Chicago city government. Michelle was recently engaged to Barack Obama. Valerie continued to work in the public and private sector throughout the 1990s and 2000s. In November 2008, President-elect Barack Obama selected Valerie to serve as a senior advisor to the president and assistant to the president for intergovernmental relations and public liaison. She went on to be one of President Obama's longest serving advisors and confidants. No one has an intimate, as intimate a view of the Obama years, nor one that reaches back as many decades as Jarrett shares in her book, Finding My Voice. She also provides us with her perspective on the importance of leadership, responsibilities of citizenship, and more. Valerie will be in conversation with Elaine Petricelli, co-founder of Book Passage. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming them to the stage. I'm so excited. Wow. <laughs> you came. Thank you for showing up. <laughs> so glad. And thank you especially to the students who are here. Uh, I'm going to be watching you to see what you're going to do when you fix this world for us. Yeah, we're <laughs> counting on you, let me tell you. Yes, it indeed. It needs some work. Uh, Andy mentioned that you uh, were born in Iran. Yes. Uh, and many of us never knew that. Uh, do you remember what it was like being a little girl in Iran? I and do. Can you tell us? Why, sure. So, well, first of all, how did I get there? That's what mm -hmm. I'm asked quite often. Uh, mm -hmm. particularly as I go through airports from the, by the customs officials. My dad said I, used to ju I should just say, well, that's where my mother was when she gave birth, but that never seems to satisfy anybody. Uh, so my uh, father grew up in Washington, D.C. My mother grew up in Chicago during the Jim Crow era, and my dad was a physician. And uh, after he finished his residency, he went into the Army, and a couple years after... Joining the Army, he decided to leave and to look for a position in academic medicine in the United States at a teaching institution, and he couldn't find a job. Uh, and the jobs that were offered to him certainly were not on par with what his white counterparts were earning. And that frustration led he and my mother to decide to explore opportunities outside of the United States. And they contacted our national, um, international health bureaus and they found a position that was available in Shiraz, Iran. Now, neither of my parents had ever been any further than Europe before. They didn't know anything about the government. They didn't know anything about the culture, the language, the anything, sight unseen. They accept this position over the advice of my grandparents and extended family. Where are you going and why? And my father said, maybe there'll be an opportunity for me there. And so out of his frustration with not being able to find a place for himself here, he and my mom go off to Iran, and he helped start the first hospital in Shiraz, Iran, uh, and he headed the Department of Pathology. I was the second baby born in that hospital. They practiced on some other poor child first. <laughs> and along came Valerie a year and a half after they arrived, and we lived there for five years. And then we went back periodically. My dad went back almost every year, and I went back with my mom uh, periodically to visit. He continued to consult at the Namazi Hospital, uh, and even went back into the 90s. He did. I stopped going after I graduated from high school, which was in 1974. I don't do the math. Just go with me on this. And, <laughs> uh, and obviously, after there was the revolution in 1979, it was hard for me to go back because once you're born in Iran, even though American parents, American citizen, you're considered an Iranian citizen. And so we thought it was probably not wise to go. Mm. Uh, but I still have vivid, vivid memories. And I say in my book that my childhood there was perfect. We lived in a hospital compound with uh, the families of physicians from all over the world. It was a time when their public health department was trying to recruit physicians to help share best practices with the Iranian doctors. And my father said it was a two-way street because a lot of people thought, well, you're going to westernize the medicine there. And he said, no, he saw diseases there and learned from physicians who had treated those illnesses. And it expanded his horizon. And for me, I was playing on this hospital compound with these children where, you know, I spoke French and Farsi and English, and I put them all in the same sentence, and we communicated. <laughs> and it taught me that I could walk into a room and find something in common with people who were very different than myself. 
Uh, but it's, it's funny because, you know, you're, your mind plays tricks on you as you're remembering what happened before you were five. I thought it was like 80 degrees and sunny every day and that that's why I <laughs> crave the sun and warm weather. And so when I was talking to my mother about my book and she was so helpful, me, helpful to me in getting my facts right, she said, you know it snowed there from time to time. I was like, what? I don't remember snow. So my memories are all wonderful. And then you came to a very exotic place, Chicago, well, where exactly. it definitely snows. Yes, it does. And, um, but your father's journey wasn't so easy there either. No, now it's, it's interesting. He, um, from Iran, in Iran, he started doing research on fava beans. I don't know how much you guys know about fava beans, but some people have a very, very violent reaction to them. And he started trying to investigate why this is, and he did a whole body of research on fava beans. It led to an expansion into this field of um, research that he was doing, and it caught the attention of, a, of the person who was the head of the Galton Labs at University of College of London. And he was offered a one-year um, fellowship there. And so my parents were thinking it was time to start heading home, as they called it, not home for me, but home for them. And so they did that, and from there he gave a paper on his research at an international conference, and the dean of the University of Chicago Medical Center heard the um, paper and offered him a job. And so my father often said that sometimes the shortest distance to where you want to go is the longest way around, and it's the scenic route, and you should think <laughs> about doing that with your life. But yeah, so when they came back, it still was hard. It was in the 60s in the middle of the civil rights era. And uh, you know, even though Jim Crow had ended, we still saw the legacy, but he was the first African-American tenured professor in the Division of Biological Sciences at the University of Chicago, a job he could not have gotten six years earlier. And absolutely fabulous. <laughs> uh, well, you had a wonderful childhood. As I read it, I thought, oh, this is wonderful. But your parents weren't easy on uh, they, they were parents who had goals. Oh, and uh, could you tell us about, uh, they taught you to work twice as hard. And yeah. I think there's another part of that sentence. Well, they left that out. You knew what it meant, though. It's like we have to work twice as hard as anybody who's white. And it's, it, I can remember coming home as a child, Elena, my mother, I would be complaining about some unfairness. And it didn't have to do necessarily with racial discrimination, but it would just be life wasn't fair. And my mother said, well, who told you life was fair? And her theory of the case was if you work twice as hard, then that buffers you. So when life is unfair, at least you're, you're well prepared. And if you work twice as hard and you, if you have a little bit of luck, then something may go your way. And if it doesn't, you'll still be fine. And that was her philosophy. And she prepared for the worst. I mean, my mom sees the glass as like a teeny bit full, even when it's flowing over. I'll give you as an example. So yesterday I called her and I said, Mom, she's 90 years old. She still works full time. I'll never be able to live up to my mother. But I said, guess what? I'm on the New York Times bestseller list. And she said, terrific. Do you have to do it again next week? <laughs> I said, yes. Yep. And that's okay. I'm enjoying this. <laughs> Whereas if my father was alive, he would say, wonderful <laughs> news. You are great. I'm so glad the rest of the world sees it now. <laughs> so I'm caught between these two different worldviews. And I probably have a little bit of both of them. And it's great that you do. But... Uh, you grew up with a plan. You had all these plans. Oh, Could yes. you tell us? Well, and as we know, when we make plans, they always come true. Well, all right. So now that we're all friends, I'm going to confess to you because it's in my book anyway. So <laughs> my plan went like this. So I went to Stanford for college, and um, I didn't really have an exact idea of what I wanted to do. There were so many people there who were like, oh, I want to be this, and I want to be that, and by 30, this. And I was like, well, I don't know. So I started out pre-med because my dad was a doctor and I thought, okay. And so my sophomore year, two things happened. I had a boyfriend who was in the medical school and he took me to his anatomy class where they were dissecting cadavers. And I took organic chemistry. And like two weeks in, I was like, you know what, I just can't do this. This is not going to happen. But to, I'm not sure which, but it was the combined impact of both did me in. So I call home and I say to my dad, I don't think I can be a doctor. He said, good, I didn't want you to do that anyway. And I was like, now you tell me. <laughs> uh, so then I was going to, I initially went there because uh, Jane Goodall was a professor. And I thought, well, I will go into anthropology or archaeology. And the summer before I started college, uh, she was uh, manning a dig in Africa. And the students were kidnapped. And it was like, it blew up the whole thing. And so 
right, I go there for Jane and the dig is over and all that's done. But I did take human biology. I didn't do terribly well in that either. <laughs> then I thought about going to business school, but there was a very good party the night before the GMATs. <laughs> and I never made it to the GMAT exam. <laughs> I told you I'm being honest with you guys. And so my mother said, well, you need to get an advanced degree because she believed, both of my parents did, in as much education as possible, and then you're prepared for life. And so my best friend was at Hastings College of Law, two years older than I, and she said, go there. And I said, okay, fine, that decision's made. And then I started to think I need a plan. And so everybody else had a plan. So my plan went like this. I was going to go right to law school. I was going to probably move back to Chicago because I'd been away and I was homesick and I'm an only child. And so I thought, okay, I'll go to law school. I'll figure out my passion in the practice of law. I will get married. I will um, have a baby before 30, thinking about that biological clock ticking away. And then I'll live happily ever after. Right? Right. So I go to law school, tick. I come back and I join one law firm, a very good firm in Chicago, tick. I found it boring and tedious, and so I applied for an even better law firm, thinking that that was the problem. Tick. I marry figuratively the boy next door, in that our moms grew up in the same apartment building that my grandfather managed. Our fathers were friends. Our grandmothers were friends. I had, uh, he was a doctor. My father was a doctor. I had had a crush on him since he was 12 and I was 8. And one day, he finally paid attention to me when I was 26. And I'd been waiting for him all that time to notice me, and he noticed me at my cousin's wedding, and I thought, perfect, I will marry you, and I did. <laughs> uh, and with all that, what could possibly go wrong, right? right. Oh, plenty. <laughs> plenty could go wrong. <laughs> I did have my daughter just shy of my 29th birthday, the most perfect thing I've ever done in life, and she's brought me enormous joy 30, for 33 years. Well, maybe not at age 14 and 15, but mostly she brought me great, great deals of joy, and now she's pregnant, and so I'm over the moon with that. Yes, exactly. Um, and, but I looked up at 31, so 10 years after I graduated from college, and I would sit in my office, and this is where my book begins, and I turned my chair away from the door, closed the door, and I did what I thought one should never do at work. I cried. And I would look out at this beautiful view of Lake Michigan, and I would wonder, whose life is this? Because I'm not an unhappy person, and I am well-educated, and I have parents who love me and who took chances, and how could I end up having taken this path of least resistance and be here? And I had to do a real gut check. And I think sometimes we ignore the most important voice, and that's the soft one inside of us. Mm -hmm. And I had a good friend who saw my misery, and he... You phone a friend when you don't know what to do, and he said to me, why don't you consider public service? You'll be a part of something bigger than yourself. And Harold Washington had just been re-elected mayor of Chicago, and had, uh, I had been captivated by his campaign, both his first one and his second one, because he wanted to bring this city that I love together, and it had this history of discrimination and racism that my mother had told me stories about, and that I had experienced as a as a, a young adult, and certainly as a child in this great city. And I thought, maybe I could make a difference and take this skill and this training I have practicing law, where I was miserable at the law firm, and apply it in-house at the lawyer in the law department at the city. And I did. I took this leap of faith, and I walked into this, um, my boss called it office with air quotes. Whenever anybody does air quotes like that, you got to wonder what they're talking about. He takes me into the bowels of the agency and he shows me my cubicle with his window facing an alley. And I did do a little, <clears throat> and I said, I'm where I belong. And I never look back. You never missed that corner. <laughs> I did not. I did not miss that law firm one bit. <laughs> but you did great things under Mayor Washington, but he died suddenly. He did so. He said, right before Thanksgiving, I used to say he died on me. I felt like it was, I came here for you, and how could this happen so quickly after I had arrived? And why did you stay? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, I loved my job. <laughs> and uh, I stayed through Mayor Sawyer, who was an interim mayor, and my mentor, who was my client, she stayed for that period too. But when Mayor Daley was elected, she said, it's time to go. He'll never be true to Mayor Washington's vision. Let's go off and start a business. And I didn't go with her. And she was angry with me for about 15 years. And she had been my mentor and my 
protector and did more to further my career than anybody I could really imagine. She'd taken me under her wing and she'd taught me not just how to be a good lawyer in-house, but how to think about policy and how to put the citizens of Chicago first. And she exposed me to high finance and brought me into the mayor's office and, and really looked out for me. She would uh, come by my house in the evening once I finally worked up the nerve to say to her, I'm a single mom and I have got to get home to put Laura to bed. And she said, well, you're on my way home. I'll just stop and you can put Laura to bed and then we can work for another couple of hours. <laughs> And I was like, oh, that's great. Let's do that. <laughs> and then I started making dinner. So she was getting something good out of it. And, but we became friends. And she's the one who asked, who really didn't ask me. She told me I needed to ask for a promotion. I'd never dreamed of asking for, for I don't know how many of you have asked mm. for promotions. Anybody? Show of hands. A few of you. You're shy. Well, well <laughs> the men, of course. But sorry. I'm sorry about that. That was... Slip that before I could catch it and bring it back. <laughs> well, I've never met a man who didn't think he was deserving of a promotion on day one of his job. But, but I just thought when my boss determined that I was worthy, he would give me the promotion. And I said that to Lucille, and she said, that's ridiculous. He's not thinking about you. Because it was really my boss's boss's boss, because I was pretty far down the totem pole. And so she said, you need to go in and tell him, not only do you, do, do you need a promotion, you need a double promotion. <laughs> and I said, that's ludicrous. And I just got to the point where I didn't really want to see Lucille because she kept bugging me about this. So I thought, oh, God, <laughs> let me just go on in and do it and get it over with, and then we can get back to what we are doing. And so I go into my boss's office, and I have my list because I wasn't going to, I mean, I was going to be prepared, at least so I didn't humiliate myself. And I said, I think I should leapfrog over my boss. I came from six years in the private sector and I've been doing this complex work and my client's very happy with me and so I think you should promote me. And I was just like, and he's like, okay. <laughs> okay, really? Okay. So I said, well, if that's the case, I, there's an empty office up in the suite of offices by you and I think I should get out of the bowels of the agency and move in there. And he goes, no, no, no. You're like 10th in priority. I got all these other people ahead of you in seniority. You can't do that. And I said, well, you don't have a woman up there, and it looks bad for you to not have a woman. <laughs> it's not good for your reputation. And he said, I have a great reputation. You don't need that office. And so, <laughs> so I said, well, how about this? How about I'll just move in, and when you decide who you want to give it to, I'll move out. Well, you know I never moved out, ever, right? <laughs> so she did that for me. And the end of the story, it has a twist, which isn't in my book. So maybe about two months ago, when I finished my galley, I sent it to Michelle Obama's chief of staff to take a look at, to make sure that, like my mother, uh, my facts were as correct as they could be. And she read it, and she loved it, and she said, you know, but there was one thing in the book that just disturbed me. It didn't make sense. And I said, what? And she said, it was that double promotion. It was just too easy. And I said, do you think? And she said, yeah, it doesn't make sense to me. So I called Lucille, who I hadn't talked to in years, to tell her she's in the book. I did this with every major character in the book, so there were no surprises. And so I said, Lucille, I want you to know what I say about you in the book. Most of it's complimentary, other than you didn't speak to me for 15 years when I wouldn't leave the city. Uh, she said, that's right, it was about 15 years. Um, and I said, but I have a question for you. I said, did you by chance say anything to my boss before I did about that promotion? And she chuckled and she said, I might have. <laughs> All these years, I thought my persuasiveness is what ruled the day. <laughs> but the lesson in it for me, and this is such an important lesson, is she not only was she my mentor and my coach and, you know, helped me grow, but she also advocated for me when I wasn't in the room. And she made me go and ask for it. And I think he would have probably just given it to, to me based on her recommendation. And I could just envision, she said, no, no, make her come in here and ask you for it. And that was a growth experience for me. And now I know why she kept saying, have you asked him? Have you asked him? Have you asked him? Because <laughs> she had it teed up and sure I wouldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so then you met another lawyer, woman did. lawyer who had been not doing too, being too happy, doing fine, but not happy in corporate law. How did you meet Michelle Obama? Well, so I met first, she was when I met her, Michelle Robinson, and um, a dear friend who appears several times in my book, Susan Schur, was the corporation counsel. And uh, we both had children in second grade in the same school together, and we'd become fast friends when I was still in the law department. And I'd just been promoted to deputy chief of staff. And I was trying to staff up my office. And Susan sent me a resume, and across the top it said, 
brilliant young lawyer, practicing law at a big firm, can't stand it, wants to consider public service. And I thought, my kind of person. <laughs> and so I called in Michelle Robinson for an interview, and I will never forget, she walked in, and she was tall, elegant, had on all black, her hair was pulled back, she had on barely any traces of makeup. She looked me right in the eye and shook my hand, and I felt this sense of warmth and uh, intensity. And she saw her resume sitting on my desk. She never mentioned it once. Instead, she told me her story. And it's a story that, of course, everybody now knows, growing up on the south side of Chicago and coming from a working class family, but parents who valued education and supported her brother, Craig, and her to go to these amazing schools. And he'd been a precinct captain. And that kind of caught her interest in service and politics. And she just wanted to know would it be a good fit. And I was so really impressed with her. And then about 20 minutes in, I slowly noticed she was turning the tables on me. And she started asking me questions that I could not answer um, about the nature of the job and what the responsibilities would be. And, and I said, I just got here myself. I have no idea. We're going to be figuring it out together. That didn't seem to satisfy her very much. And then uh, I would say after about an hour, 10 minutes, I just blurted out a job offer. I had no authority to offer her a job. As I said, I had just gotten there. I had a boss, hadn't talked to him about her. And she was wise before her years. And she demurred. And she said, I'll get back to you on that. And so a few days later, I'm talking to her, and I said, well, what do you think? And she said, by this point, I'd cleared the offer, and I really wanted her. And she said, well, we have a problem. My fiancé doesn't think it's such a good idea. I know, that's what I said. Who's your fiancé, and why do we care what he thinks? <laughs> what are we talking about here? I thought we bonded. And so she said, well, would you be willing to have dinner with us, and let's talk it through? And I said, yes, that was a really smart move on my part. Mm -hmm. And so I went to dinner with Barack Obama and Michelle Robinson, and we talked about my life in Iran and his life in Indonesia. And it started out, it always goes like this, like, well, he said, where are you from? Chicago. Did you grow up here? Yes. Were you born here? No, I wasn't born here. I was born in Iran. And I expect, you know, kind of a fatal conversation. And he said, oh, that's interesting. I lived in Indonesia for a while. And we started comparing notes. And at the end of the dinner, I thought, I found somebody who actually has a different, you know, the same world perspective as I do, has felt like an other because it's so different than what we're, everybody's accustomed to. And we clicked about that. And Michelle and I clicked about having grown up in these happy homes with parents who loved us and invested in us. And the three of us developed this relationship that's now 28 years old. How lucky we are. <laughs> How lucky I am. My goodness. They changed my life forever. But you met this young guy and his wonderful fiance. Did you ever imagine that this guy was going to go to the White House? Well, of course I did. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what, Elaine? I'll tell you the truth. At the end of the dinner, and it was like a three hour dinner, we talked about everything. And what was clear is that they wanted to serve. They wanted to give back. They understood the motto that those too much is given, much is expected. And I remember looking across the table at them, and I was thinking about him. I said, you know, I bet you one day, just possibly, he could be mayor of Chicago. <laughs> that was the ceiling I gave him. And so, <laughs> really? yes, he, yes, because that to me was like all I could imagine is, yes. you know, Harold Washington had been the first African-American mayor of Chicago, and I thought, this guy could maybe go that far. I didn't at that time, anticipate just how far he would go. And, and then there was his career as a, a politician. And uh, I, one of my favorite parts of the book is when, with Michelle's encouragement, you brought some friends together to talk him out of a run. Not yes. for president, I think it was Senate. Yes, U.S. Senate. Just to refresh your memories, those of you who are not a student of what is now history, he ran, um, after he'd been in the state senate, he ran against Congressman Bobby Rush in our district. And he lost, and he lost very badly. It wasn't just like a close call, it was like embarrassing. And I thought he should wait a little while and kind of develop a better reputation in the, in the state senate and make another run at maybe go back against Bobby Rush or something else. I hadn't thought about it, but I just thought it was way too soon, and so did Michelle Obama. In fact, she thought it was like, enough of this already. Why don't you go get a real job and um, you know, be present in the lives of now your young children? And 
So we concocted this plan to have a brunch at my home, and we invited our closest friends, all who have been briefed ahead of time on what the objective of this brunch was. And in the course of three hours, not only did he convince us all, even Michelle, that he should do this, but my last two things I said to him that I mentioned in the book that I won't forget, as I said, I'm afraid that if you lose, then your political career will be over. And he said, if I'm not afraid, why are you afraid? And I thought that was so, it, it caught me. I didn't really have an answer to that. He said, look, the worst thing that happens is I lose. But I won't be a senator if I don't try, so I might as well try. And I think the time is now, and I think I learned a lot when I lost my race to Bobby Rush that will help inform me. And I said, but you lost the district we live in. How are you going to win the state of Illinois? <laughs> and he said, I have a plan. And I said, well, finally, I said, well, how are you going to raise any money? You don't know anybody. And he goes, you're going to chair my finance committee. Uh, uh. <laughs> so, and Michelle said, the last person to speak, as usual, she said, okay, if we do this and you lose, we're done with this, right? And he said, yes. And she said, okay, I'm in, and I hope you lose. <laughs> <laughs> no, in all seriousness, she worked her banning off, as did we all, and as you know, he won. And so when he decided... He called me uh, over the holidays in 2006, and he said, I think I'm going to do this thing, or do it, I guess it was. And I said, I knew what it was. And I said, well, this time I'm going to be out in front. I'm going to be, yes, let's run for president. It'll be great. And he did, and it <laughs> and was. And he did, and it was. And we're so, we're so glad you were there with him. I was and, and, uh, honor of a lifetime. Well, we're, we're going to talk more about that. But I'd like to talk a little bit about the campaign because many of us have read Michelle's book, and uh, frankly, reading the two books together is really important and to see your viewpoint, her viewpoint, and I, I'm just so happy that we were able to do this. Uh, but, you know, she got put out on the campaign trail, and not everything went so well, uh, and any time she, even when she didn't stumble, there were people who misinterpreted what she said, and then there was the whole thing about the reverend who had married them. Um, you were right there. Yes. How do you handle that when your dear friends are up against something like that? Well, you know, it was excruciating, honestly, because as I've shared with you, I knew them so well. They are the younger siblings that I never had. That's how I feel about both of them. I love them, and I respect them, and I know their values, and I know what they wanted to do for our country. And so to see people malign them unfairly, and there was the birther allegations that he wasn't born in this country, trying to delegitimize him, and, and you know, when she said, this is the first time I've been so proud of my country, they took her totally out of context. And we would send her out because she's such a superstar. She was really being treated like a principal by the public, but we were giving her staff of a spouse. And so it was totally unfair to put her out there the way we did. And everybody's, the focus of the campaign was on him, the candidate. Mm -hmm. And the resources were behind him. And you know, he used to fly private, and she's flying Southwest Airlines, which is a lovely airlines, but you can't predict whether or not it's going to get where you want to go on time. And so, I mean, there was a total inequity in the way resources and support were being offered. And it, came, it kind of blew up, and I was there when it blew up, and I felt as I, that I, as a friend, had let her down. Mm -hmm. And we had a tearful moment where she said, why didn't you tell me that this wasn't going well? Why didn't you tell me mm -hmm. how some people were perceiving my intensity as an angry black woman? And I just thought, you know, they would see what I saw. And I was looking at it not as a professional advising her, but as a friend, and I did her a disservice, mm -hmm. as well, is how I felt, and she felt that way too. Uh, but we got through it, and she had an opportunity to reintroduce herself at the Democratic Convention, and um, Michelle Obama is, is a perfectionist, and she's like, okay, if they think that I'm that angry black woman, they don't know me, and so let me go back to the beginning and tell, us, tell the story. She did. And she knocked it out of the park, and I think that night... Uh, the American people and people around the world fell in love with her and saw her for who she really is. And how fortunate that you were there. Even if, even if you didn't tell her in the beginning the trust that made it possible for you to do that. Well, you work things through with friends, and sometimes you mm -hmm. disappoint them, and it doesn't mean you don't love each other, but you do try to do better. And I did learn a lesson there, which is that uh, when you're an advisor, you have to, as a friend, be honest in ways that maybe other people can't. Mm -hmm. And so 
I took that to heart with him. He perhaps wishes I hadn't taken it quite so much to heart, but I never held back anymore. <laughs> well, speaking about having to tell him, uh, would you tell us about Stevie Wonder giving you advice in the American Legion Hall in Indianapolis? Well, so first of all, I love Stevie Wonder. And, right? I see a little Stevie Wonder fan at club over there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> my college years were full of Stevie Wonder, as well as my adulthood. And so I knew that Stevie Wonder was playing, and this is in the middle of the primary, right before the Indiana primary, which is pretty far along close to the end of the primary season, which went on way longer than we had ever anticipated it would. And so I was so excited about meeting Stevie Wonder. And of course we arrive after his concert's over because they maximize the time of the candidates. So he never gets to just arrive and enjoy a concert. We arrived as Stevie was on his last song. And as Stevie, Stevie came off the stage and he came in to greet uh, then Senator Obama, he walked over to me and my heart was beating and he leans over close to me and he said, I smell smoke on his clothes. And I said, I'm meeting Stevie Wonder, and he's telling me about, he smells smoke on his clothes, and I'm like, what do I, what? and he said, tell him he needs to stop smoking. I'm like, oh, great. So that's my first introduction to Stevie Wonder. He ruined it for me. Well, that night was a very hard night, and it was a bad omen. We went outside for the speech, and just as then Senator Obama goes out to speak, little mists of rain come down, and if you are, a black woman with hair issues, as some of you might know, the worst thing for you is mist because an umbrella doesn't help and my hair started rising and <laughs> I'd miss Stevie Wonder and I know he, and it's cold and miserable. And after he spoke, we had about an hour uh, before he had to go and speak when shifts changed at midnight. He wanted to go to a factory to greet the workers when they came off the shift and we sat in a conference room and it was really an all-time low. And it's interesting. Reverend Wright was a, an existential threat, we believe, to his campaign. And what he was so frustrated about, as you can imagine, is here it's his pastor who is turning into this huge, huge liability. And what, uh, what Barack said is, like, all these young people worked on my campaign, and I'm so afraid of disappointing them. So it wasn't about him. It was about their hard work. And really, he would, worked himself up, and he was so distraught that two of his best friends were traveling with us, and we, the three of us, decided we just had to make him laugh. And so we started just being ridiculous as friends can be with one another, and one of them was mocking Reverend Wright, and it was pretty good imitation of him. And finally, finally, Barack Obama starts to laugh. And we thought, thank goodness. And just as he starts to laugh, in walks David Axelrod, who was his advisor in the campaign, senior advisor, and said, I have bad news. You're down 12 points in Indiana. We're like, oh, come on. We just got him to laugh. Don't tell him that. <laughs> well, it turns out he, he barely lost Indiana, which was a testament to his grit and hard work. And the same night, he won North Carolina. And that yes. is really what got us um, over uh, the edge in the primary season. So it was a dismally sad night. And the, the final note I would mention on that night is that Marty Nesbitt, one of his best friends and I, who was traveling with us, we got into an argument in the car while Barack Obama was out, out shaking hands with the guys at the shift change. And so uh, he climbs back in the car, and we are screaming at each other. And he goes, what are you two talking about? And we were having a debate over what we would call him if he was elected. <laughs> and I said, we have to call him Mr. President or President Obama. And Marty's like, I'm not calling him that. He's going to always be Barack to me. And I said, look, okay, but maybe but you can call him that in private, but whenever you're around other people, you have to call him Mr. President. It's not just about him. It's respect for the office. And so Barack gets in the car, and he goes, Ugh. so we tell him what we're fighting about, and he goes, if by some miracle I pull this out, you're all calling me Mr. President. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is so much in this book. It's so rich that uh, I just can't wait. So all of you come in my store and tell me how you felt reading it because you're in for such a treat. Thank but you. when you joined the administration, I mean, did you know during the campaign you were going to be in the administration? Was that planned? No, no what I really thought is I wanted to be the ambassador to France because oh. I love Paris and I had been at the embassy and it's very pretty. And... Uh, <laughs> 
I thought, oh, I could see myself here one day. And I, I think it was in 1996, I went to Paris with Mayor Daly and we went to the embassy and I just thought, what's up those stairs? How cool would that be in the, in the ambassador's residence? And so I told him early on, if you win, I want to be the ambassador to France. And I said, you're going to make a lot of new friends, but you just remember I was with you back in the day and this is what I want. And then about six months out, I, was, I told everybody of this, a good friend of mine said, you're not going to want to be all the way over there in France when they win this. You're going to want to be right there. Well, at this point, I'm CEO of a company, and I thought, well, I can't uproot myself to go to Washington. France, yes. Washington, no. <laughs> and, uh, and near the end, we never really talked about it until we were on a plane together in maybe July or August. It was after he'd won the nomination, and he said, you know, if I win this thing... Uh, I'm going to want you to go with me. And I thought, we'll see. Let's not jinx it and talk about it now. And there was a brief moment when I thought about throwing my hat in the ring to take his place in the Senate. And in fact, my daughter, my parents, everybody thought that's what I should do. Uh, but he and Michelle Obama had other ideas. And Michelle kind of cut right to the trace, and she goes, you're not going to do that. And he was much more subtle. He said, well, let me explain to you what I would want you to do in the White House. And when he described my responsibilities, which would really be the gateway into the White House for the American people, as well as state and local elected officials, and having worked in local government, that was appealing to me. Um, what do you do when your best buddy says, come work for me, and he happens to be the President of the United States? So I said yes. And thank goodness you did. And uh, you were really the conduit to people like governors all over the yes. country. Yes, yes. Uh, and I was reading in the book about the oil, the horrible oil spill. Did any of you remember the oil spill? Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that because it didn't get much attention once we figured out how to plug that hole. But it was every single day the same pelican covered in oil, and it would be like, oh. and then the oil gushing, and it, oh my gosh, it was a nightmare. And the mm. five states that were involved in the oil spill, from Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, and Texas, all had Republican governors. And President Obama came up with a brilliant idea in day two, when it was clear we didn't have an immediate solution. He said, I want you to get on the phone with him every morning, at the first thing in the morning, and I want you to do this until it's over. Because I want them to know that whatever's going on on the ground, you will come and tell me, and it will be handled at the highest level of government. And the way we ran our Office of government, Intergovernmental Affairs was totally nonpartisan, because it was not a political office. We ran it as a service office where governors, regardless of party, were welcome because they represented the American people. And as president, we didn't view them. <laughs> that was our approach. Uh, <coughs> I'm sorry. I'm really, I try to not to control myself. Uh, <laughs> but it was, um, and so I thought, okay, well, all right. I knew them all anyway, and I thought, well, how bad could it be? A week tops, right? Three months, seven days a week, those five governors. And it's funny, you know, you develop a relationship with them. And one of them, Governor Jandell of Louisiana, he didn't always act in the best faith. In fact, once we were on a, the, conference, the 9 a.m. call, he had Janet Napolitano, who was the Secretary of Homeland Security, with him in his office, and he raised an issue. And I said, Governor, I promise you we'll get right on it. And he said, Okay. And he hangs up the phone, and he and Janet went from the phone call to a room next door and had a press conference, and he said, well, I've asked the White House to address this issue, and they haven't taken care of it yet. <laughs> it was like, I hadn't even got my TV on yet, and I'm like, I, you just asked me to do it. But the next morning, I was like, Governor Jandell, what can we do? And that was our attitude, is that we had to be that conduit for them, and it did get solved, and out of it, I mean, I actually, Governor uh, Bob Riley of my mom's uh, parents' home state, or my father's home state of Alabama, we got to be really close friends. He's one of my favorite people in the world, and so it just, just goes to show you that when you put politics aside, you actually see people for who they are. Governor Jandell, not such good friends with. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you had so many challenges, and they're beautifully described in the book, but could you tell us about a couple of your favorite days in the White House? Well, every day, even the worst days, had a magical component to it because I was old enough to appreciate what I had. I used to think about some of the young staffers and how disadvantaged they were, that they went to college and then they went 
right that summer to work on the presidential campaign, and then they won, and then they went to the White House line like, you didn't earn this. I went through a whole career <laughs> to get to where you are today. So I did really appreciate every day, but I'll tell you one day that was, I call it the most extraordinary today. And I won't say, I'll also tell you another story about what was the best moment, but the most extraordinary day was a day where uh, I was sitting in the chief of staff's office and my assistant came in with a note and it said, the marriage equality decision was just, cut, just came down from the Supreme Court, 5-4, and we won. And, ugh. and we weren't expecting it because the Affordable Care Act had also gone up to the Supreme Court for the second time. And that decision had come down the day before. And so we were completely unexpecting to, unexpecting to have two back-to-back -back decisions. And so I jump up and I announce to the senior staff in the room what happened. And the chief of staff, Dennis McDonough, said, look, this was your issue. Your staff has been working on this since day one. Why don't you go down and tell President Obama? So I go rushing down to the Oval Office and I get there and he's not there. And I'm like, where is he? And his assistant said he hasn't come downstairs yet. I said, it's 10.15, what do you mean? And she said, what can I tell you? He's not here. So I go back to uh, the chief of staff's office all dejected, and he goes, well, what did he say? And I said, he wasn't there. And he goes, well, did you call him? And I thought, well, no, I didn't call him. I guess I could pick up the phone and call him. Well, the chief of staff's assistant heard this conversation, so she's furiously dialing the White House operator, and I pick up the telephone, and he goes, what? <laughs> so that's a little off-putting. And he never uses that tone with me, or anybody else for that matter, so I, it caught me off guard. So I said, uh, sir, uh, the marriage equality decision came down today, 5-4. And there's a pregnant pause, and he goes, and who won? And I was like, darn it, I buried the lead. So I said, we did. And he said, oh, it's been a great week. I'll be right down. Well, the reason he was late is he was upstairs working on his eulogy for Reverend Pickney, who, together with eight of his parishioners, had been murdered in Charleston just the week before. And... Let me tell you, one of the hardest things that we had to deal with were these, this epidemic of gun violence that we have. And you read about the mass tragedies in the paper, but every single day in streets of my hometown of Chicago, people who should not have access to guns are using them against both themselves and other people. In fact, of the 32,000 plus people who die every year from gun violence, two thirds of them commit suicide. So it's a horrible tragedy, and we have been to so many, so many memorial services, the worst of which was at Sandy Hook. But each of them, horrendous. I went with Mrs. Obama to one in our hometown of Chicago for a young woman, 15-year-old girl, Hadia Pendleton, who had marched in the inaugural parade three weeks earlier and was gunned down really just blocks from where we both have homes in Chicago. Uh, so... We thought that this was gonna be a really, really hard event. And the more that you go to, the fewer words you have left to say. And President Obama's speechwriter had come to him a few days earlier and said, it's hopeless, I have nothing, I have nothing in me. I got nothing left for this. And we got into a conversation about the black church because you may remember that soon after those murders, this young man who walks into a church and in the black community, churches are always open, even though there's a history of attacks on the black church, including to this day. Uh, but the spirit is one of openness and everybody's welcome. And this young man at the age of 21 could sit through an entire Bible study conversation and at the end of it, open fire and tell one woman who he let survive, I want you to live to tell this story. And then two days later, they go to the, uh, to the courthouse for the arraignment and they say, we forgive you. We forgive you. And that is amazing grace. And so this... Um, incredible speech that he delivers later, which Bob will get to, is all about amazing grace. But at the time, he was still struggling to find the words. Meanwhile, we have a decision from the Supreme Court, so he's got to give a speech about this landmark case. They're building the stage for the Rose Garden. Every time there's an event in the Rose Garden, they build a stage, and they're out there hammering, and I'm trying to find the plaintiffs on the case for the marriage equality case so he could congratulate them, it's chaos. And he's still working both the eulogy and the speech. And what I remember so much about that moment was that normally when he's in the Rose Garden, the unwritten rule is, is that staff stay behind. You shouldn't be out hanging out in the Rose Garden. You should be working. We're in the White House. We're busy. Now everybody's in their office watching it on TV, but you're not supposed to be out <laughs> in the Rose Garden. And this day, the entire colonnade that you've seen so many times on television was packed 
hundreds of staff outside wanting to witness this moment of history. And what I remember most was his comment about, you know, progress sometimes, you know, it seems like it's taking baby steps and then suddenly like a thunderbolt, something amazing happens. But don't forget the decades and decades of the years that people worked to make that happen. And when he took office, marriage equality was only the law in two states. And by this point, it was 37 states and the District of Columbia, which shows you how this progress happened state by state by advocacy. And I've always wondered, what if that case had come up when it was only legal in two states? Might we have had the same decision? You don't know, because there is this inner connection between culture and the law, and the culture had swung, and it gave the justices a space they needed, I thought, to do the right thing. And then we take off for Charleston, and where the pall of another funeral was coming over us, and so he tried to lighten the mood, so he said, I might sing. I might sing Amazing Grace. And a couple years before, some of you may remember, he sang Al Green in New York, and I was the person, and it broke the internet, right? And I was the person backstage going, don't sing, don't do it, when he said it back then. And the technicians who were working the equipment were like, sing, Mr. President, sing. And I was like, it's not presidential, and you're not that good a singer. Don't do it. <laughs> Speaking truth, as I said, I did. Well, of course, he sang. And it was great. So this time, I'm like, sing, sing, just like run for president. <laughs> and we go into the service, and it's a celebration. And everything I expected in terms of being sad and crying, none of that happened. And he stands up and he sings at this moment and he paused for a second and I wondered, was he thinking, was he going to sing or not? And he told me later, no, no, he was just trying to figure out which note to start in. Um, <laughs> and then we fly back to the White House and a junior person on my staff three weeks earlier had said, I, she came to see me and she was in charge of our LGBTQ outreach. And she said, I have an idea. I'm not sure you're going to think it's a good idea. I'm not even sure if it's possible. It may not work. And frankly, it's not actually my idea. It's somebody else's idea, and they gave it to me. And I'm like, what is the idea? <laughs> and she said, how about if we win to light the White House in a rainbow? And I was like, that is a good idea. Mm -hmm. And let me just figure out, is it doable? Because we'd never done anything quite like that before. And it was doable. And so mm -hmm. as the sun set when we returned from Charleston, uh, we didn't really tell everybody what was going to happen, but you could see, of course, very light pastel colors. And as with social media these days, it word caught on. And Lafayette Park, by the time the sun went down, was packed. And I spent three and a half, four hours outside on the, on the North Lawn that <coughs> evening looking at this moment in history that will be iconic. And the photographs mm -hmm. that you'll see, the president would always get letters asking him for photos that were seen. The number one photo requested was of that night with the White House lit up, and it came from a person who almost didn't tell me the idea. Uh, <laughs> that was the most extraordinary day. Mm -hmm. So you've been through all of this and tough things, uh, the uh, Binding of Osama bin Laden. The, we could go on for <coughs> excuse me for months talking because, but I'm not going to do that because you have to all go home and read your book. And we had lots of good questions, but we got to them within the the, uh, the talk. But there's one thing we want to know. Uh oh, What's you have so much talent. Yeah, you have Thank so you. much experience. You are a true leader. What is ahead for you? Ah, well, a few things. So after the 2016 election, I took a deep breath. I turned 60 a week after the election. Nobody wanted to celebrate my birthday, <laughs> including me, I might add. But it was kind of a watershed. It's like, for those of you who are 60, it's like a big number. Uh, you know, you really have to kind of come to reckoning. And it's the first time in my life that I really kind of said, I don't want a, a job. I've had the most perfect job in the world. In fact, I used to always tease President Obama. My job was so much better than his. Um, and I loved what I had done. And I wouldn't have left a second before the eight years were over. I started on January 20th while he and Mrs. Obama were, in, were outside at the inaugural parade. I don't like the cold. And I had spent enough time outside in the cold with his announcement in Springfield. And I was like, okay, I'm going inside and find my way around. And I stayed until after he had left for the inaugural ceremony 
in uh, 2017 at about a minute to noon, Secret Service was eyeing me, saying, it's time to go, Valerie. Um, so I say this to say I really loved what I had done. And I thought, this is a time where I could think about, what do I want to do? Uh, I had had a chance to work on every single issue that crossed his plate. That was the role of senior advisor. I'd had these great responsibilities for being the gateway. I'd worked as chair of the White House Council on Women and Girls, and I loved this fight for gender equity. So I said, what do you really like to do? What do you want to do in this next chapter? And so the first thing uh, I did together with Tina Chin, who I'd also worked with for all eight years, was we formed an organization called the United State of Women. And it's dedicated to gender equity and lifting up evidence-based strategies to make life for women and girls on an even playing field. And it's everything from encouraging girls to go into STEM, to focusing on uh, violence and, and sexual harassment in the workplace, to paid leave, um, equal pay, paid sick days, affordable childcare, entrepreneurship, healthcare, all of the issues that um, affect whether or not we have gender equity in this country. And so we are about the business of that. And we travel around the country and we have sessions and we had a huge, huge summit in Los Angeles um, Last summer before last, 6,000 women showed up. It was great. Last summer, I guess it was. Fabulous. And so I work on that. I, I also care a great deal about civic engagement. So I'm helping President Obama with his foundation, which is a platform for teaching civic engagement to the next generation, help people with bold, great ideas, take those ideas and implement them and, and take them to scale as well. And the other civic engagement piece is Mrs. Obama and I created an organization called When We All Vote. When I uh, went through the stages of grief over the last election, sometimes all in the same day, um, I had to settle on something, like how did this happen? And I, there are probably a thousand explanations, but the one that I focused on was one I thought I could do something about, and that is that 43% of eligible voters didn't vote. And that profoundly troubles me. I don't understand how we have a democracy without participation in the democratic process, the most fundamental important part of that process is voting. And so we created an organization to try to change the culture about voting. It's a nonpartisan organization. Uh, this isn't about electing Democrats. It's about getting people to appreciate their responsibility of citizenship. And we launched it last summer and we partner with organizations all over. And uh, I think uh, the other piece of it that's really important to both Michelle Obama and myself is it's not just about a presidential election. It matters who's on your school board. It matters who's your mayor, your county board, elected official, the governor, who's in the state legislature drawing the lines that determine how much money and representation you have in your state. So that's a big piece of business that we're working on. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you. I joined uh, three boards, and I'm fascinated with that work. And I'm on the speaking circuit, and so for, we didn't really talk too much about how painfully shy I used to be as a child. But I used to really not be able to speak in class. I, would have, I blushed to the point of really it being paralyzing. And uh, now I make my living speaking, which is crazy. But I love it. I love it. And I love being able to travel around the country. And, I've, and I think people say to me, well, why are you optimistic given everything going on in the country? And I say, because I get to meet just so many I call them ordinary people who are doing extraordinary things, who still care about this country, care about their community, and are giving back to it, and are making a difference. And so having a chance to do that is just, and meeting many of you this evening, just the highlight of my life. We are so lucky. That <laughs> And I get to be a grandmother soon. That's, that. That's really the best. Yes. <laughs> she has no idea how great it's going to be. I can't <laughs> wait. As much as she's excited, she doesn't know. <laughs> but we will be, well, I don't want to say this to be creepy, but we will be watching you. <laughs> and thank you. Cheering you on. And if we can help get that vote. You can. Yeah. Each of you can. Go register and then go get 10 more people to register and participate. So that and will we be, yeah, we'll be coming back to you for that. Thank you so much. You're Valerie, welcome. Jared, Thank you. And